order in the court. Order in the court. This courtroom will come to order. Now, whether you've been in an actual courtroom to see that played out, or maybe you just watch a lot of Law and Order on TV, I'm sure you're familiar with that scene. With the banging of the gavel, all conversations are hushed. The judge enters the courtroom and takes his place. Or maybe during the trial itself, if there's an outburst in the gallery or between the attorneys, the judge will use the gavel himself and demand that order be restored. Now as we approach the final chapter of the book of Joel, subject is judgment is coming. We saw in the first chapter that the locusts are coming. And Joel was pointing to a situation in his own time, a plague of locusts that had come and destroyed the crops, and said, folks, God is getting your attention. Repent from your sin, return to him, and you will be restored. Then in the first half of chapter 2, Joel goes beyond the immediate situation of the locust plague and says, the Lord is coming. And if you thought the locusts were bad, when the Lord comes, if you're not ready, it's going to be so much worse. He is coming in judgment. He will judge the ungodly. And there will be no way out. Now in the second half of chapter 2, Joel spoke of the Spirit is coming. That time when the Holy Spirit would come in a way unfamiliar to the age in which he lived. See, in the Old Testament times, the Holy Spirit would only come on certain individuals, usually for just a temporary time in order to accomplish a certain, uh, a certain assignment. But God, through the prophet Joel, promised that a day would come when the Spirit would be poured out on all kinds of people, young and old, male and female, educated and uneducated, uh, the famous, the unknown. All kinds of people would receive the Holy Spirit. They would prophesy in His name. They would serve Him. And the Holy Spirit would not leave. We saw how that was initially fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. And how the echoes of that reverberate right down to our own day and age. Now we come to the third chapter of Joel. And he reverts back to the themes of his first couple of messages. This idea that judgment is coming. Now other prophets also use this idea of the theme of God as a judge in a courtroom. I like the way the message paraphrases Isaiah 3 verses 13 and 14. It says, God enters the courtroom. He takes his place at the bench to judge his people. God calls for order in the court. Hauls the leaders of his people into the dock. You can almost hear the gavel as you read that verse. Habakkuk 2.20. God is in his holy temple. Quiet, everyone. A holy silence. Listen. And that's what the gavel is all about. It's to bring the people to silence. So that they listen. Pay attention to what's going on. So Joel sets the stage of judgment is coming in the first three verses of chapter 3. And this is the Lord speaking. In those days and at that time when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. There I will enter into judgment against them concerning my inheritance, my people Israel. For they scattered my people among the nations and divided up my land. They cast lots for my people. They traded boys for prostitutes. They sold girls for wine that they might drink. In those days and at that time, God is pointing forward to a future event, one that had not happened in Joel's lifetime, one that hasn't happened yet for us. All these centuries later, God says he will bring the nations to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Now that word might sound a little familiar because there was actually a king of Judah named Jehoshaphat. But there was no valley of Jehoshaphat. You wouldn't find it on a map or in any Bible atlas. 
Some think that he's speaking here of, of the plain of Megiddo, uh, something we're going to talk about in a little bit, and perhaps that is uh, what this is referring to. But the name Jehoshaphat means the Lord judges. And if anything, this is probably a figurative term for the place where God judges. This great eternal courtroom where God will judge the people according to what they have done. Gathering the nations. Now, this judgment day is going to take on a different flavor for different people. And Joel is going to point out three truths about uh, this judgment that is coming and how we can be prepared for it. The first thing he says is that the day of the Lord is going to be a day of vengeance. We've talked a lot about the day of the Lord. Uh, Joel may have coined the phrase himself if he indeed was one of the earliest writing prophets. And in the third chapter, he describes the day of the Lord as a day of vengeance in verses 4 through 13. Now what have you against me, O Tyre and Sidon, and all you regions of Philistia? Are you repaying me for something I have done? If you are paying me back, I will swiftly and speedily return on your own heads what you have done. For you took my silver and my gold, and you carried off my finest treasures for your temples. You sold the people of Judah and Jerusalem to the Greeks, that you might send them far from their homeland. See, I'm going to rouse them out of the places to which you sold them, and I will return on your own heads what you have done. I will sell your sons and daughters to the people of Judah, and they will sell them to the Sabaeans, a nation far away. The Lord has spoken. Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for war. Rouse the warriors. Let all the fighting men draw near and attack. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weakling say, I am strong. Come quickly, all of you nations from every side and assemble there. Bring down your warriors, O Lord. Let the nations be roused. Let them advance into the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge all the nations on every side. Swing the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come trample the grapes, for the wine press is full, and the vats overflow. So great is their wickedness. Move down to verse 15. The sun and moon will be darkened, and the stars no longer shine. And verse 19. But Egypt will be desolate, Edom a desert waste, because of the violence done to my people of Judah, in whose land they shed innocent blood. It's a day of vengeance, a day of God's wrath, a day of destruction, a day that, for those who will receive it, they're not looking forward to, but it's a day that will be unavoidable. Now, I really believe that this passage may have been on the Apostle John's mind when he was reading the book of Revelation, we're going to see several cases in Revelation that sound like echoes of Joel. The first is in Revelation 14. Now we looked at this in a couple of messages ago. Revelation 14, verses 14 through 16, that speaks of the coming of the Son of Man to gather His people unto Himself. And we'll be caught up in the air with him. But then following that, verse 17 we read, Another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. Still another angel, who had charge of the fire, came from the altar and called in a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, Take your sharp sickle and gather the cluster of grapes from the earth's vine, because the grapes are ripe. The angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered its grapes, and threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. Doesn't that sound like Joel? Almost the same words. They were trampled in the winepress outside the city, and blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as a horse's bridles. For a distance of 1,600 stadia, 
which being interpreted is about 180 miles. Can you imagine that? I mean, this last week we've been seeing uh, pictures and videos, the flooding that's happening in Kentucky, where, where homes are being destroyed and, and lives have even been lost as the floodwaters come through and, and, and the mess that has to be cleaned up. Can you imagine a flood of blood four feet deep for 180 miles? That's what John is writing about here. This is the day of the Lord, the day of vengeance. Once the believers are harvested from the earth, now it is a time for God's wrath to be poured out on the unrepentant sinners. And you see that described in Revelations chapter 15 and 16, where seven angels pour out the wrath of God and in fact, it says these are the last plagues, last because with them God's wrath is complete. Now, if we look at the sixth bowl of God's wrath, it's recorded in Revelation 16, verse 12. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. And then I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs, they came out of the mouth of the dragon, this is Satan, out of the mouth of the beast, the Antichrist, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. They are spirits of demons performing miraculous signs, and they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for battle on the great day of God Almighty. Here's the day of the Lord. This is an uncommon way of referring to it, but it means the same thing. The great day of the Lord. Then in verse 16, they gathered the kings together to a place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. That's a word I'm sure you're familiar with, even outside of the Bible or church. There was a, a popular movie entitled Armageddon. That phrase is, is used often to speak of the end of the world or a great military battle that's likened to the Battle of Armageddon. That comes out of this passage, and it was initially prophesied back in the book of Joel. We see the devil and the Antichrist and the false prophet trying to gather all the armies of the world together in one place. I personally believe they initially gather to fight each other. But when God appears on the scene, they join forces and try to attack him give you three guesses how that battle turns out. Actually, we don't have to guess because the Bible tells us that at this place called Armageddon, uh, the Valley of Megiddo, uh, what some interpreters think this Valley of Jehoshaphat's referring to, this wide open plain that has been the scene of many battles throughout the ages, that all of the armies of the world are going to gather for one final battle and this is where the Lord will come. The day of the Lord will commence. And the battle is going to be short. It's actually depicted in Revelation 19, beginning in verse 11. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. Once again, the language of Joel echoing the book of Revelation. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, Come, gather yourself together for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and of mighty men, of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all people, 
free and slave, small and great. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who had performed the miraculous signs on his behalf. With these signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and who had worshipped his image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest of them were killed with a sword that came out of the mouth of the rider on the horse, and all the birds gorged on their flesh. This is the battle of Armageddon, the battle of the great day of the Lord, and it will be victorious over all the powers of evil. Now, this theme is also seen in other prophets like Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Zechariah. Usually it is Yahweh himself who rides out in victory and destroys his enemies. The most vivid prophetic picture of this is in Isaiah 63, verses 1 through 6, where an unnamed conqueror strides forth in crimson-stained garments. It says he has trodden down the winepress of God's wrath. He has stained his garments with his enemy's blood, and he establishes this day of vengeance. Now, John sees Jesus Christ as the fulfillment of that prophecy. In Revelation 19, it says that his robe was dipped in blood. I used to think that was his blood that he shed on the cross. But no, that's a reference back to Isaiah 63. This is the blood of his enemies because he's trampling the winepress of God's wrath. That striking image from the prophet Joel. And it says that all of the armies of the world will be cut down with the word that comes out of his mouth. The battle isn't much of a fight. It's going to be all over in an instant. And Christ is going to be victorious. The day of the Lord is going to be a day of vengeance on God's enemies. But you know, there's another side to this day of the Lord. It'll also be a day of vindication. Going back to the beginning of chapter 3, Joel writes, In those days and at that time, when I restore the fortunes to Judah and Jerusalem. It's going to be a day of vindication for God's people. While it's a day of destruction for God's enemies, it's a day of deliverance for his children. Verse 16 promises, The Lord will roar from Zion and thunder from Jerusalem. The earth and sky will tremble. This is a scary scene. But the Lord will be a refuge for his people, a stronghold for the people of Israel. It's scary for God's enemies, but it's glorious for God's people. It'll be a day in which they are vindicated. Their faith will shine forth and be rewarded. You know, history has been filled with tyrants and despots who rule with corruption and murder. You have these madmen that traffic women and children. You have zealots who mercilessly kill people who dare to disagree with them. And it leaves a lot of us wondering, God, don't you see what's going on? Don't you care? Aren't you going to do something about this? And God says, yes, I will. The day is coming when all of those atrocities are going to be judged. And all the people that seemingly got away with it here on earth, their time is coming. It's very reminiscent of early in the book of Revelation when the souls under the altar say, Lord, when will you avenge our blood? How long will it be until justice is served? And God says, just a little longer. It's pretty much the cosmic equivalent of, are we there yet? The answer is no. But the reason why God is waiting is because he is patient. He is giving sinners every opportunity to repent, to avoid his wrath that is coming on all sin. But he has given them a way out, and if only they would take it, they could escape his wrath. And for them it could be a day of vindication. So he is being patient in his mercy and grace. Now the results of this are seen in verses 17 and 18 in chapter 3. 
Then you will know that I, the Lord, your God, dwell in Zion, my holy hill. Jerusalem will be holy. Never again will foreigners invade her. In that day the mountains will drip with new wine, and the hills will flow with milk. All the ravines of Judah will run with water. A fountain will flow out of the Lord's house and will water the valley of the Acacias. Here, the land is restored to its bounty and blessing. And again, we hear echoes of Joel in the last book of the Bible. In Revelation 22, as John sees the new heaven and the new earth, he writes in verse 1, then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing down from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. The river of life. This fountain flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. I believe it's the same fountain that Joel speaks of in verse 18. I think it's the same thing that the psalmist wrote in Psalm 46, 4. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. This is all being fulfilled. You know, the book of Revelation, like the book of Joel, was addressed to God's people to encourage them to persevere through the difficulties they face. They both attempt to lift the gaze of God's people from the immediate circumstances they're encountering to give them a larger view of God's grand design. His eventual settling of accounts with all those who treated his people violently. His eventual restoration of his people to full and abundant and peaceful life. And you know, in this way, these books, really, the Bible as a whole, retains its relevance for every generation. He's encouraging us to hang in there. Stick with it. Hold on to your faith. The time of vindication is coming. We're just waiting for those last souls to come to Christ, to repent of their sin, to join us in that great day of vindication. You know, the prophecy of Joel began with tragedy, the invasion of the locusts, but it closes in triumph with the reign of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 19, 28, I tell you the truth, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. May we never lose the wonder of his kingdom. The day of the Lord is going to be a day of vindication for all those who follow him. So there's two sides to this day of the Lord. But there's a third truth that Joel emphasizes in this third chapter. And that is that it is a day of verdict. Verse 14, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near. In the valley of decision. Earlier he had spoken of the valley of Jehoshaphat. Where the Lord judges. Here it's called the valley of decision. It's a different Hebrew word. And it carries the connotation of a verdict. A sentence that's being read. You know I've heard some preachers use that verse. Uh, in an evangelistic sense. You know. Valley, the valley of decision is where you decide. But by this time, it's too late for those decisions. The only decision being made here is the decision of God, the verdict of God on the lives of these people. It's too late for them to change their mind, to repent and return to the Lord. Their decision has already been made. The only decision here is the decision of God. And that decision will determine their destiny for all eternity. But I want you to understand this. The day of the Lord is still future. It hasn't happened yet. It's something we still anticipate. We live in the present. And in the present, you still have the opportunity to decide whom you will serve. 
You can still make the choice to repent of your sin, to return to God, to be restored into His favor. So that the verdict read on your behalf is, this is my child. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Or, will it be, as was read earlier in Matthew 25, depart from me into everlasting darkness, to the place prepared for the devil and his angels. Those are the only two verdicts that are going to be made. Welcome or depart. Heaven or hell. What will it be? You see, ultimately, every person who ever lived and did not trust in the Lord will appear at a judgment. It is described in Revelation chapter 20, what I think is perhaps the most tragic passage in all the Bible. Revelation 20, verse 11, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. Earth and sky fled from his presence, and there was no more place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. The great white throne is history's highest court. Its verdict is incontestably final. There will be no arguing over evidence, no quibbling over procedures, no outrage over the decision, no appeal to a higher court because there is no higher court. The gavel will descend, and all humanity will yield to its irreversible verdict. You see, the valley of decision is a reference to God's decision in final judgment. But because judgment comes only after death, the decision to put our faith in God, to receive Christ, is something we make today. That decision is ours to make as long as we have life. You still have a chance to determine what verdict you will hear. Whether it is welcome, you who are beloved of my Father, or depart from me, I never knew you. That's a decision you can still make today. Many years ago, A.B. Simpson wrote a hymn in which the chorus asks, What will you do with Jesus? Neutral, you cannot be. One day your heart will be asking, what will he do with me? We've seen the answer to that question. He is either going to welcome us into heaven or send us to hell. And that verdict is dependent upon the decision we make now, whether we are putting our faith in Christ or not. And that decision will determine your eternal destiny.